After spending an entire semester learning about the adverse effects of excess nutrients in the Chesapeake Bay, we set out to explore possible solutions to the problem. One tool that stood out was the Nutrient Trading Calculator, which generates a quantity of tradable credits based on a number of factors, including the nutrient reduction, the permanence of the practice, and even the practice's proximity to the main stem of the bay. We pursued a wide variety of perspectives on nutrient trading in order to determine what influences the value of credits and the success of trading in the bay watershed. To begin our research, we turn to Dana York, the lead evaluator of agricultural best management practices in Maryland. Her company, Green Earth Connection, has allowed her to communicate with farmers and encourage them to participate in nutrient trading. So in order to train in Maryland, this baseline assessment is done. And um, what happens again is you do that very same analysis where you say, what is the type of land, cropland or pasture land? or hayland, and then how are they managing that? And they basically are looking on, what is the crop that is being grown? When was it planted? What were the nutrients that were put on that crop? When was it harvested? So what I like to tell farmers is, is many times if you've met the baseline, you're already doing a lot of these practices. Why not get an economic benefit from it as far as your bottom line, but also get a payment to maintain that? because. The whole point is, is that for the public at large, that keeps that land productive, potentially could keep it in farming because they're usually their profit ratio is pretty small. And this additional income might just be the difference of them farming and not farming. Early in our exploration, we discovered that when phase one of the watershed implementation plan was established in 2008, wastewater treatment plants became the first entities capable of generating tradable credits in Maryland. This established the possibility of point source to point source trading. Chestertown has an exemplary wastewater treatment plant facility that is well below the required limits for nutrients released, but the plant has not attempted to participate in trading. Now, the plant that we have, that $9 million, was paid for by the people that live in Chestertown. To let people outside of town tie into that, we would, I think they would, I would have to go to the town council and get approved, but they would have to pay their share of that cost. And one of the issues that we have right now is there's an entity that wants to tie in septic tanks to the town, but they don't want to pay to tie them into the town. And that's not fair to the people in Chester Town who have paid for the system. As the ENR facility, we have to get our total nitrogen below 3 milligrams per liter and our total phosphorus below 0.3 milligrams per liter. So typically at a larger plant, you can target and be more effective in the nutrient removal. Things balance out over a 24 hour period at a large plant. If you were to try to do the same thing at a smaller plant, it would be a lot more difficult because your flow is going to be more inconsistent. So the larger the plant, the easier it is to, to target and focus on what you want to do. Septic tanks being so small, on any given day, if it's clothes washing day and you, you have a lot of phosphate, there's nothing that's going to remove that in your septic tank. I can't do zero on nutrients because if I did zero, the rates in Chestertown would be 10 times what they are to provide the equipment to achieve that but we're doing much better than everyone else. Agriculture is currently the only non-point source capable of credit trading in Maryland. This began in 2010 when phase two of the watershed implementation plan was established. The kinds of best management practices would be cover crops, wetlands that might be created, Riparian buffers, both trees and grass buffers. This is a great time to be raising corn in this part of the, of the country. You've got ready demand from the poultry industry. You've got high prices. And so people are reluctant to take land out of corn. The resistance is greater in the farming community. People who go into farming are kind of, one of the reasons they went there is they didn't want to work in a large bureaucracy. They didn't want to have a lot of regulations. 
This is true of what, watermen and farmers and other people. I think some students don't like to be regulated too much either. I mean, I do personally know some farmers that just have absolutely no concern whether it's clean. They're going to do things that are regulated um, so they don't get fined, but they're not going to go any, you know, above and beyond that to any scale. There are also farmers out there that are working on their own projects, their own innovative BMPs, because they're not within a specifications of an NRCS practice or the Soil Conservation District practice, there are no funds available for them, so they just do that out of their own pockets. Now, the big question of all the farmers are is how much is a pound of nitrogen and phosphorus worth? And it depends who you talk with. They bounce around, nobody's really buying phosphorus right now, they bounce around that a credit might be worth $30 to $50. Now, for a farmer, you're going to sign up for 10 years. Trades must be 10 years in Maryland. And so you'd have to sit down and think about, do you want to lock yourself into doing this kind of farming that brought you whatever that credit was worth for 10 years? Because that's a very long time in a farm life of what they're going to do. Now, if credit's got to be $1,000, then I bet you'd have people lined up the door because it would be very much worth you know, everybody is so great at kind of pointing the finger at somebody else. We've all got to realize that we've got to be involved. People will quickly see that pile of manure on a farmer's field and they're ready to complain about that. And yet they'll go home and put excess fertilizer on their own lawn. They won't have the kind of buffer that they need at the water's edge. It's the easiest to point the finger at the farmers because they are handling the nutrients directly, you know, like, you can say, you know, we know that you put this much nitrogen on your farm field. Um, but I think that part of that is a result of people not realizing where nutrients can come from besides farmland. Um, so there's a lot of runoff that comes from you know, urban areas and other things that people just don't think about. The biggest problem in urban areas is the collection and treatment of stormwater runoff. Currently, no urban best management practices are capable of generating tradable credits in Maryland. Nonpoint to nonpoint source trading will not become an option until Phase 3 of the Watershed Implementation Plan is established. This legislation is currently under review. You've got to figure out some way to capture the stormwater in an area that's we're almost basically at sea level and do something with it. And what that something is, is, you know, kind of up in the air. This map shows the times when best management practices to reduce stormwater runoff have been implemented in Chestertown. It is noticeable that very few have been introduced more recently than 2010. Putting in certain Management practices can be really inexpensive, but if you're trying to make a difference with your the quality of the runoff, then you don't want to be limiting yourself to what's going to be the cheapest. Those urban BMPs are generally so expensive, uh, they're going to have trouble even getting to the baseline, much less uh, getting extra credit, if you will. Many of the ag BMPs are available at uh, $10 a pound for nitrogen, $5, sometimes even less. Uh, urban BMPs often will cost you $500 for that same pound of nitrogen. Huge differentials there. Urbanizing areas have gone 50% to the bad because just growth alone, adding more streets, more impervious surface, is going to take you to the bad side of an environmental assessment. There are a lot of people in the other sectors in the stormwater and septics that would like to be able to do this instead of doing their TMDL because per pound of nitrogen it's a lot cheaper to do an acre of land as opposed to a wastewater upgrade or a stormwater upgrade. I don't think that we can afford the extremely high cost of the WIPs without nutrient trading. Our counties can't afford that. Not at the same time they're trying to do roads and schools and sewers and these sorts of things. I think it would be frankly be immoral 
for us not to look for responsible ways of reducing the cost of reducing pollution. One of the issues with, with nutrient trading is what's called additionality. You're looking for what additional reduction uh, can be achieved through these practices. So additional incentives, I think, make sense. But it is hard to measure that, and that's, that's critical. A goal isn't the number. The goal is what your overall intent is. If your overall intent is to keep the nutrient levels in the Chesapeake Bay the same, then go ahead and, and do your trading. If your goal is to get the Chesapeake Bay as free of pollutants as you can, then the goal should be reduction, not trading. Reduction across the board. We've got to be assured that Pennsylvania is going to do their part, that New York is going to do their part. Otherwise, not only will we have pollution coming down the Susquehanna and to the Bay, but frankly, most of the people in Kent County would say, no, yeah. if they're not doing it, why should I? And they would stop. My perspective and SRA's perspective, if they end up doing the trading within sub-watersheds, it could work. I think it's a terrible idea if it's going to be done on a Chesapeake Bay scale. Basically, they're looking at the mid-bay as the area that needs to be cleaned, instead of looking at you know the tributaries and the rivers and all the streams, headwaters separately. Because you know basically what we're going to end up with if we do it baywide are very very dirty waters in some areas and very clean water in some areas. That's not really the goal. Now I'm mixed on that. I don't really like to let bad actors get off the hook to trade for somebody doing a good job? I'm somewhat of an outlier on this. Uh, there are probably worldwide 200 river keepers. I don't think more than 10% of us really think that nutrient trading is a good idea. N nutrient trading assumes that you can afford to allow the pollution to happen at a different location. And I don't agree with that. If your purpose is to reduce nutrient pollution that needs to happen across the board at all facilities. Not saying, for instance, the town of Chestertown, you're only using 50% of what you're allocated, you can sell it to somebody. And then what, sell it to a company so that they can dump twice as much as they were, or four times as much as they were dumping? That doesn't make sense if what it, the, the goal is, is to clean up the Chesapeake Bay. Trading can only be done for growth in the state right now. So it's only for increased urbanization or for a point source to increase its capacity to be able to um, do that or potentially to upgrade a temporary credit. If the nutrient trading program is one more arrow in a quiver of tools to get people to do the right thing, then yes, then, then it is an incentive. It, 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 it can't be the only incentive. I think it, it has to be a full spectrum of education, tax benefits, uh, grant programs. Unless they add cleans up their job, but towns don't. You're not going to help the water at that point. The whole point was to clean up the water without cleaning out our wallets. Any money that's used to promote conservation practices or BMPs is going to benefit the general public in that you're going to have a cleaner bay. Cleaner streams, cleaner bay. So, you know, obviously if you're going out with your kids boating or skiing or fishing or crabbing, or if you eat seafood from the Chesapeake Bay, you're going to, you know, you're going to see those benefits. We got great crabs and fish. They can't tell the difference whether that nitrogen was reduced at $5 a pound or 500 so in the end, yeah, cleaner environment is, I think, economically going to be better. Our original intent was to determine how political, cultural, and economic motivations all factor into the value of tradable credits. Based on the discussions inspired by this initial research question, we discovered that not many people feel a connection to nutrient trading. The cultural and political support of the program is slowly emerging, but there is limited knowledge of how trading should be implemented in our watershed. At this time, nutrient trading can only be used to reduce the net load of nutrients released into the Chesapeake Bay. If knowledge of the program and its purpose were to increase, we believe trading could successfully prevent excess nutrients.